What is the surgery and the steps and the strategy to treat parathyroid adenoma when you have hyperparathyroidism? I'm Dr. Bob Aquilario from Center for Advanced Parathyroid Surgery. This is a very interesting question, something that I have a lot of passion for, so let's go ahead and start. When you have symptoms of hyperparathyroidism, the way you get diagnosed obviously is by doing labs to check your calcium, PTH, and vitamin D, right? When you see an imbalance between these three numbers, you know there's something going on with the parathyroid system. If the numbers are subtle, you may have to repeat it a couple times to confirm. If the numbers are very clear, the one set of tests can actually clarify your diagnosis. Once you're certain of the diagnosis, then you have to locate the abnormal parathyroid gland. 85% of the time, there's only one gland that's abnormal. 10% of the time, there's two or three parathyroid tumors and 5% of the time, all four parathyroid glands are abnormal with all of the cells in all of these glands being abnormal. So in, in the 85% of cases where you have one parathyroid tumor that's abnormal, if you do a scan that clearly shows you where this abnormal gland is, then you can focus in and do a minimally invasive surgery to fi find that particular gland and treat it and not touch or cause scarring in other parts of your neck. So let's go through that. The localization scans come in many shapes. Ultrasound, I, th I think, is um, my favorite, I would say, because it has no radiation. I can do the ultrasound in the office, and immediately when the person patient comes to see me, I can tell them if I see the abnormal gland and what the strategy would be thereafter. So that's an easy way, a very non-invasive. It doesn't involve any injections or contrast or radiation exposure. It's a very good way of doing it, and I think in the hands of a surgeon, who not only does the ultrasound, but gets to do the surgery, the anatomy is more clear because you get to see what you see on ultrasound and then in the person itself. If the ultrasound does not show it, my next scan to use is a 4D parathyroid CT scan. I find the scan to be very helpful and very effective in, in cases where the ultrasound is not clear or just doesn't show anything. I rarely use the SESTA EV spec because it's just not as accurate of a scan and it's not as anatomic as I would like it to be. I like more detail. I like to have a GPS on where your tumor is so that I can focus in, know where it is, and go right there and take that parathyroid gland out without looking all around your neck to get to that one problematic spot, right? Um, so this is an ultrasound of a patient what we're gonna go through and talk. This patient had a parathyroid tumor here right underneath the thyroid gland right, on the right side. And if there is a nodule, you can see the nodule as well inside the thyroid. So if you need to address that nodule, you can certainly do it at the same time. So when you have hyperparathyroidism, instead of having four normal parathyroids that are functioning equally, you have one gland that has developed a tumor in it, and this tumor is producing massive amounts of PTH and essentially taking the parathyroid calcium system hostage. The remaining glands that are not working shrivel up and get smaller, right? They're not gone, they're not dead, they're not sleep, they're just smaller. Just like muscles that you don't exercise shrivel up and the ones you exercise get bigger. Same concept. The fortunate um, characteristic of the parathyroid hormone is that its half-life is less than five minutes. So whatever parathyroid hormone I produce now, in five minutes, half of them disintegrate, right? So when you have a parathyroid tumor that's producing a large amount of PTH, when you take this tumor out and check your parathyroid hormone level at five, 10 minutes or so on, your PTH should go down by at least 50%, right? Preferably into the normal range. I usually like doing a one PTH level after I've made the incision and I'm inside right before I'm about to take out the parathyroid. So I know exactly the PTH is right before doing it. And then once I remove the parathyroid, at five, 10, and 15 minutes, I check three more PTHs because I wanna see a downward sloping parathyroid hormone level that stays steady in the lower level. That is not jumping up and down or doing anything that's, that makes me doubt that the, the one parathyroid is the only problem. I want assurance in the operating room that the surgery has been successful. And usually these smaller parathyroids take about three weeks to get larger and resume full function. So 
I do like supporting my patients during those three weeks by giving them supplements so that the calcium level doesn't dip too low and get them into trouble. All right, so let's look at the steps of surgery. First, I usually make an incision in the lower part of the neck in this area that has a little bit of a dip because that incision can hide well. The skin in the neck folds in this way, so these lines. So if you make the incision in the lines of the neck, it hides actually better. Even if you don't have a line, if you go in the trajectory of the line, then the incision heals better. My incisions are usually about a centimeter and a half to two centimeters, so just, just shy of, a, uh, two, of an inch. Relatively small, it's in the lower neck, you can see it here. This is a cross section. So if you were to do a cross section, this would be it. On cross section, you can see the breathing tube here. You can see the thyroid gland, just going across. These are muscles. Let's do the muscles in red here. These are the muscles of the neck. Right. And then the parathyroid in question is there, and the vocal cord nerve is usually close to the parathyroid gland. Okay, so let's look at the next step. Once I've made the incision and I'm inside, I get a PTH level, right? Sometimes I do it immediately after making the incision. Most of the time I go one or two steps further before I'm about to remove the parathyroid that's abnormal, right? But once you make the incision, a small incision in the middle and get the skin to separate, then you can see the muscle layers, right? These two muscles, which are right there, right? The, the next step is to retract the muscle so you can see the thyroid gland. This is the thyroid gland. So you're seeing this part of the thyroid gland. The next step is to retract the thyroid itself, pushing the thyroid away. Then I can identify the vocal cord nerve. Let's draw the vocal cord nerve in red here, which is here, and you can see it right there. It was white, I'm covering it with the red. And then immediately next to it, you can see the parathyroid tumor here and here, okay? So if you've identified the parathyroid in advance and you know where it is, you can hone it. Now, if during surgery you have any doubts and you think maybe another parathyroid on the same side could be problematic, you can easily change the position of your retractor, dissect up, and find the other parathyroid, which in this case was normal. You can see it's small and barely visible. Then I remove the parathyroid, I cauterize the tiny little blood vessels here that are feeding the parathyroid to stop them from ever bleeding again. And then at 5, 10, and 15 minutes, I get PTH levels, right? And I check the PTH levels. If the PTH levels show a more than 50% drop in numbers and then go into the normal range, I know the surgery has been successful. I don't have to go looking for any other parathyroids. I don't have to go to the other side and violate the integrity of the neck on that side, potentially cause scarring or damage or injury to any of the surrounding tissue unnecessarily. If the PTH doesn't come down, that's when I have enough reason to do further exploration because now I know with a higher PTH that hasn't come down appropriately that there is another over-functioning gland. If the PTH drops, I know the other glands are normal functioning, right? And I don't need to go violate that area. But do I need to cause scarring under the surface. I don't need to create the potential for further complications and risks. I've minimized the risk for my patients. I minimize the scarring that occurs under the surface. So when we say minimally invasive, we don't mean just a small incision. We mean, we mean being less invasive under the surface. And this allows me to be that way. Once that's done, I put one suture here and bring the muscles together in the midline. I put two layers of sutures under the surface that are absorbable and they disappear. And I put a piece of tape on. So you would wake up with just a little tape on top of the skin. The day after surgery, you can shower with that tape on. And one week after surgery, you peel the tape off and then manage the skin to prevent it from getting damaged by the sun or affected by the sun and leaving a scar that's visible. All right, and I'll give you instructions on how to do that. I always draw, um, a figure of the surgery that I've done so that I know the exact details. Now, this surgery can be done under local anesthesia, right? And local anesthesia is when at the beginning of the surgery, I go in and inject the person 
on the side of the neck, and then I inject the area of the incision in the middle. The nerves that go are, are in charge of feeling for the neck start from here and go down like this. So this injection is on the side, blocks those particular nerves, right? And you know, prevents the person from feeling. So if a person is thin in their neck, they don't have sleep apnea, they have the option of having the surgery under local anesthesia, like I'm describing, without a breathing tube. They'll be breathing on their own, right? This is perfect for a patient who's having primary surgery, not a revision surgery. They have a thinner neck and they don't have sleep apnea because those conditions allow a perfect environment for this type of surgery. Patients can be fully awake or they can get a touch of sedation so they're sleeping and not feeling or remembering anything. Now, after the surgery is done, I put everybody, all my patients, on a calcium replacement regimen. Why? When you have hyperparathyroidism and your PTH levels are high, that high PTH goes to your bones and tells the bones to release calcium in the bloodstream. That causes depletion of calcium in your bones, right? So your bones are getting thinner. Now, even if your bone density shows that your bones are normal, your bones have still lost calcium because that high calcium in your bloodstream is not coming from you eating too much calcium. It's not eat, having too much dairy products or too much ice cream or uh, almonds or anything like that. It's happening because your bones are leaking out calcium and losing calcium, right? So your body actually has a deficit of calcium, right? Your bones have a deficit of calcium, even though your bloodstream has extra calcium within it. 98% of the calcium in your body is in your bones. 1% is in your bloodstream. So if that 1% is high, right? That 98% could be diminished in the terms of the calcium that it holds. So I always give patients calcium. I look at their calcium levels before surgery, right? And based on that, recommend a regimen that starts that evening after the surgery is done and every morning thereafter. And I decrease that regimen every week. So we start at a certain level, we go lower and lower. And after three weeks, if they have not had any symptoms of low calcium level, which is numbness and tinglings in both fingertips or around your lips or muscle cramping, I know that their parathyroid, the other parathyroids are beginning to work. And as long as they have a good um, diet that is rich in calcium, they shouldn't need supplements. On the other hand, if they have a lot of symptoms or if they have severe uh, bone loss and osteoporosis, I do recommend that patients continue to take calcium supplementation with vitamin D in the long term. Why is vitamin D important in this scenario? Because without vitamin D, you only absorb 20% of the calcium you consume. With vitamin D, that absorption goes up to 80%. So vitamin D is very important in this scenario, right? I also give my patients magnesium because magnesium helps with this system and stabilizing the calcium system post-operatively and lessening the symptoms. Um, that is in general how I, I treat my patients. I also give my patients uh, my uh, cell phone number because I want to be in direct communication with them. If they have symptoms of low calcium during, the, let's say, the first week of surgery, I know that their regimen may not be adequate for them. And I, if I hear from them that they've had symptoms once or twice, then I know that I can adjust their regimen to make sure they get what they need. The surgery can be very simple in the hands of an expert surgeon. Uh, who is thorough, who is interested in treating parathyroid patients, and is interested in being connected to you and managing you and taking care of you. Hopefully this is helpful. Uh, if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to us so we know what kind of videos you like, and I can make further videos that hopefully can help you. Be well.